Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll get started here in just a second while everybody uh, has a chance to connect so we don't get started without them. So bear with us for a little bit of awkward silence while we wait for everybody to uh, file in. All right, we've got a, a good number of people online, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us today and welcome to our webinar showing your hyperspectral data who's the boss. My name is Zach Norman and I'm a product manager at L3 Harris Geospatial Solutions. <clears throat> our presenter today is Megan Gallagher. Uh, Megan's been a part of our team at L3 Harris for a couple of years now and back when we were working at the office, Megan and I were cubicle neighbors. A um, couple of fun facts about Megan. Uh, she's our resident SAR expert, and so very familiar with remote sensing and, and GIS, apart from just hyperspectral. Uh, and she went to college at the Colorado School of Mines. Just a couple of housekeeping items here before we get started. Uh, nobody that's online right now will be able to talk. You're all muted. So if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, feel free to use the uh, questions area of the Zoom uh, interface uh, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. You also see a few of us going through and answering some questions while we present too. So feel free to enter your questions in at any time. This webinar is being recorded and we'll have it up on our website at www.l3harrisgeospatial.com in the next couple of days. We'll also email you a link to the recording as well as the slide deck, which you're welcome to share with colleagues or friends. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan. Thank you, Zach. All right, we've got a lot to cover, so I guess we can just jump right in. Okay, today, we're going to be showing your hyperspectral data, who's the boss. Uh, once again, I'm Megan Gallagher. I'm a solutions engineer here with LV Harris Geospatial. And our agenda for today is first, we're going to go into a little bit of who we are at LV Harris Geospatial. And then we're going to jump into the hyperspectral part of things. The first part of the agenda we're going to go over is before you process. Last week, Austin did an amazing talk on just getting to know hyperspectral data and what you need to know. So before we start today's talk on really showing that data who's the boss, we're going to go over some key points on making sure that these are what you need to do before you can do that. After that, we're going to be going over some hyperspectral use cases and workflows, some things that are pretty commonly used in hyperspectral analysis that you might not have heard of before. After that, we're going to be going and taking a look at the NV modeler and NV server. Uh, so we can see how to very easily use some of this hyperspectral analysis and workflows. The lovely image on the right of this slide is a whole bunch of spectral indices, if you're wondering. So let's get started. First, a little bit about us. L3 Harris is a global aerospace defense technology innovator, and we deliver end-to-end -end solutions that meet customers' mission-critical needs. We have over 400 locations internationally and over 50,000 employees. Us in particular is geospatial solutions. We focus on uh, commercial geospatial analytics, off-the-shelf custom geospatial products and services, data and imagery, and machine learning technologies. Today, we're gonna take a look at some of our core offerings. These include in particular Envy and Envy Server. We have over 30 years of experience with this technology, especially hyperspectral data processing. So we're going to cover these today, but we do have a wide breadth of different products that we work with. In Envy, it's an image analysis software that we use to deliver scientifically proven results. We have a lot of data support for hyperspectral course with this webinar, multispectral SAR images, just plain JPEGs, whatever you're throwing in there, radar, LIDAR, what have you and a whole bunch of different ways that we integrate with other systems, as well as allowing for processing with that. So that's us in a nutshell. Let's get into that hyperspectral now. So before you process, data choice. I have made all the mistakes I'm about to list here, and hopefully this will help you not make the same ones. So before you process, you need to take a look at the kind of data that you're interested in. What is the size of the feature that you're looking for? Are you looking at the entirety of a forest or are you looking at a specific single type of vegetation? 
because that'll play a part in what kind of sensor that you need or want to actually be able to pick up that information. What kind of coverage do you need? Do you want the entirety of the world or are you working on a small geological area of interest? And then repeatability. Is it just a one-time study or service that you're doing? So do you just need one really good picture or are you going to need to have repeated collects over an area to watch change over time? All these things come into play when you're starting to take a look at what kind of data and system you need to use for hyperspectral, which we'll be going over a lot of them later. Related to that is making sure that the system that you have and use actually gives you the information that you need on your area of interest. A common example of hyperspectral data is you might be looking for specific chemical interactions in vegetation. Uh, going beyond maybe just looking at the greenness, you might be looking at very specific products and you need very specific wavelengths or bands to get that information. As such, you need to make sure that whatever kind of sensor you're using does cover those bands. So just when you're thinking about using hyperspectral or multispectral or any kind of remote sensing, think of first of what you're looking for and make sure that the system that you're about to choose will cover that. So once you have your data and it, has, and it covers what you need it to do, one of the other things that you should always do with your data, especially UAV or aerial data, is called orthorectification. Or as I like to say, putting things where they belong in the proper place. On the left-hand side, we have an unorthorectified image, which is uh, either of those roads are the pretty, some pretty bad roads that I've ever seen in a collect, or this thing needs to be orthorectified. On the right-hand side, we have the proper image, which actually shows us that this entire thing needed to be rotated as well. When you're using UAVs or aerial, it's very important to have GC keys on the ground, points of collection, ways to make sure your data goes where it needs to, especially if you want to do repeated coverage over areas of interest. So if you're doing something over time, you need to make sure things are where they're supposed to be so you can actually compare you know, apples to apples and oranges to oranges or whatnot. And there are a lot of different orthorectification tools in the NV software that will fit your needs for whatever kind of situation you found yourselves in. Last week, Austin went over this a lot, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but one of the most important things to do for your hypospectral data before you process is atmospheric correction. So when you're working with multispectral as well, you have a tiny bit of leeway, but you can think of it as this. If I, need, if I have an image and I need to compare it over space and time to any other information, it must be atmospherically corrected. So whether I have a stack of images where I need to see that change is occurring, or if I have a mosaicing that needs to occur, multiple images that need to be put together, these need to be atmospherically corrected so they actually compare to one another. For hyperspectral, however, it just needs to be atmospherically corrected. There's no ifs, ands, or buts there. Because the bands are so discrete, you need to make sure that everything is exactly as it should be and we get rid of as much noise as possible caused by the atmosphere. So sometimes, rarely, don't do this in multispectral. You can't get away without doing atmospheric correction. You shouldn't. But with hyperspectral, you must always atmospherically correct it. Uh, there are multiple atmospheric correction tools and the most commonly used with hyperspectral data is Quack or Quick Atmospheric Correction and Flash, which is fast line of site atmospheric analysis of hypercubes. There are going to be a lot of acronyms during this talk. I will do my best to define each and every one as they come up, but please feel free to put a message in chat if I accidentally don't cover one of those. The last thing we're going to cover of the before you process is mosaicing. So I had to stick this image in because if you've ever worked with hyperspectral data, if you've ever taken an intro to remote sensing class, this might look very familiar. This image is over Cuprite, Nevada, which is very well known for having hydrothermal geological just minerals on the surface. And Avaris uh, by NASA JPL took original images over this area in 1998, and it has pretty much become the stock photo of remote sensing for hyperspectral analysis. If you've taken a class, you've probably seen this image. This one here, though, is actually a collect from the Avaris Next Gen sensor, and I believe it was 2014 or 2015. And so this is an example of just a mosaic and framework of how we take all these flight paths, overlay them, and we'll be able to stitch them all together to get useful end products for processing. 
and I had to stick to pregnant at in here. All right, that's enough of the before you process. I think I've covered the most important thing. And if you want to go into a bit more background, you can go into last week's talk with Austin Coates. So let's get started on taking a look at some of those hyperstructural use cases and workflows. So we're going to be going over some use cases. We're going to take a look at the data that they used and the methods that were used to get sort of a generalized coverage of what is commonly done in hyperspectral data analysis. So you can show that data who's the boss and you can have your turn with it. First, we're going to take a look at finding plastics. We have two use cases here. One is using adaptive coherence estimator or ACE on agricultural fields to find plastic. And the other one is using minimum noise fraction or MNF and spectral angle mapper or SAM to look at plastics in the ocean. And this was done with NOAA. We will also be looking at organic matter. And we are looking at a study that used principal component analysis or PCA for fecal matter detection. And lastly, we're going to end it with a quick look at some interesting stuff on penguins. So finding plastics, scenario one. The data that was used here is Avers NextGen by NASA JPL. And the method that is used is Adaptive Coherence Estimator or ACE. And I will be going over exactly what that means. The image is shown on the bottom of the screen here of an absolutely gorgeous Avers image over some fields in Southern California. And if you look at the bottom middle, you can see some plastic that is on these fields as well. And that's what we're going to be focused on. Avarice Next Gen, or NG, is an aerial hyperspectral system by NASA JPL. It records between 380 and 2,510 nanometers at about 5 meter resolution. And we can see a coverage chart of the original Avarice on the bottom here, uh, where we can see just the amount of bands that exist for all of our areas of interest and all of our properties that we want to be able to see. So average next gen there. Now we're going to get into ACE, our adaptive coherence estimator. And don't be afraid of that lovely little math equation. I had to stick it in there. So ACE is used when a target is known. Say you have a very specific thing that you're interested in, a target in this case, like I said, it'll be looking for plastic and you know where one example is, or you have an example of what it looks like. It then uses that unique target or that unique end member to classify an image. An end member can be thought of as a pure pixel that is a pure standard in an image. So I might have, in this case, an end member of plastic or an end member of a certain very specific kind of vegetation, and that is the pure spectra for it. Uh, when we're using ACE, you don't need to know all the end members in a scene, which is definitely a plus because there can be a lot of them. So let's get into a little bit of the mathematical background on ACE and then take a look at what it does. So ACE is based on a function called the general likelihood ratio. And you could think of this ratio as the probability of a pixel being the target of interest or not being the target of interest that we have. However, because you might not know how much of a target is in the scene, it, like you don't know how much of what you're looking for is in there, that's why you're looking for it. The ratio is called generalized. You're making a generalization of how much of that ratio is for what we're looking for. ACE in particular lets the problem believe it knows the background data. It knows the background histogram that exists and allows us to simplify the processing and has been proven to give really great results overall, especially for target detection. So that lovely little equation on the bottom here is actually the simplified version, which will give us our fantastic results. The outputs for ACE are you get a band for each end member that is classified. So you could think of it as a true or false. Is this our target of interest or is this not our target of interest? And so it's very good for just, like I said, target detection and finding what we're interested in. So let's take a look at how I would go about using ACE. So the method. I have chosen a single pixel of our plastic that is over these fields here. You can see that little spectral profile in the middle. And if you have worked with hyperspectral data before, you can very easily see that there seems to be a lot of vegetation background in here. So in this case, for this process in this study, that's perfectly fine. But one of the things you could do is if you know what kind of vegetation you're looking at, or if you took a sample from just a little bit north of where I took the original sample, the left-hand side image, 
you can actually get that vegetation spectra and separate it out from the plastic if you wanted to do a much more rigorous study, try and find just the plastic spectra that you're interested in. But that isn't what we're doing right here, but it's fun to talk about anyway. So we choose that singular point where we're able to get a very nice spectral response of the plastic that is covering this region of interest. We can take a look at the spectral profile and see how it is, make sure it is nice and clean and ready to go. And then we simply open up the ACE dialog, which is shown on the right-hand side of the screen. We take that spectra, we can drag and drop it in there and say, this is what I'm looking for. And then the process will just run over this entire scene to find areas that match that spectrum that we've chosen. So this can be done with definitely more than one spectra. You can have a whole bunch of setup and ready to go. So, you know, tens, twenties, the hundreds, if you feel like it, to be able to find those unique end members and pull them out of our scene. So we can just get in and see what those results look like then. So scenario one, we can see on the left-hand side of the screen is our original output. And there is a lot of noise, and this was caused by some speckling issues in some of the imagery that I was using itself. But we can also see from that singular pixel, we have a very well-defined three field coverage over those areas where we saw some of that plastic. And we can then clean up this image a little bit by, in this case, I just reset the histogram so we could get a clearer view on those areas that were classified. And then on the right-hand side, we took that classification image and overlaid it on top of the fields themselves. And you can see that where we had that plastic originally, with one single pixel, we have now classified all the plastic over those fields. So ACE is a very powerful tool to use when you're trying to pull out very unique end member information. All right, on to the next one. Finding plastics scenario two. We're actually gonna be looking at two different ways to find plastics in the ocean. Uh, with one of them, we used Worldview 2, which is a multispectral sensor. But the process that we used is one that is most definitely useful in hyperspectral data analysis. Thus, we're still going to be going over it. And the other one is DSIS, uh, using DSIS data from Teledyne Brown Engineering, Engineering DLI. The methods that were used here was minimum noise fraction, or MNF, and spectral angle mapper, or SAM. So let's go take a look at that data. For the world view too, as I said, it is a multispectral sensor. It is a satellite constellation that has eight bands and it has less than two meter resolution. So it's ish. And then we have DSIS, which is a hyperspectral sensor. It is mounted on the International Space Station. It has about 235 bands between 400 nanometers and 1000 nanometers. And it has 30 meter resolution. So let's get into the background here. So MNF uses something called principal component analysis to simplify the multitude of bands available and return bands that have unique signal information. So we're getting into something that is called dimensionality reduction. So let's say I have a hyperspectral sensor and I have 300 bands of data information. The thing is though, is that not all that information is unique. You have bands that are very close together that are giving you the same kind of information. And if I want to run processing, sometimes it can be very, very slow with the amount of bands that I have, or I can have confusion because of the similarities between bands. So funnily enough, even though you've invested to get these 300 bands of hyperspectral data, a lot of the times we don't want all of it. We just want the data that's relevant to what we're interested in. And that's when we get into things like PCA, because what PCA does, principal component analysis, is it takes a look at our data and it pulls out the most unique values. It, in the mathematical terms, it reprojects our entire data set to fit certain eigenvectors and eigenvalues. But in a more generalized term, we're looking for the unique parts of our imagery and those are separated out from the non-unique parts or noise. So with PCA, we take our 300 band data set and we, get, we can move it down to about five bands that actually give us important and unique information. So this very much simplifies the rest of our processing and makes it a lot easier to work with the amounts of data that we have to, or in some cases, if we need immediate results, this makes things go a lot smoother. So I can talk about it all I want. Let's take a look about what it actually looks like. 
here we have a PCA analysis over some fields. We have nine of the PCA bands shown here. So, you know, one, two, it labeled on the left-hand side of the image. And we can see that as we move down, or I guess get higher in band number, we're getting more and more noise and less and less information. However, that information in all those first nine bands and all of the 300 bands that might exist beyond that is unique. So if I was to do analysis here, I could take a look at these scenes and be like, well, the first four bands seem to hold all the unique information that might help me with my classification or study. And so those are the only bands I need to use for any future processing. When we add minimum noise fraction to PCA, it helps get rid of a lot of the noise we might see in a scene. We use a technique called noise whitening that gets rid of noise correlation over bands. In English, basically the bands that are smaller have more coherent information, and the bands that are larger, like closer to 300 in this example, have the most noise. So we're reducing noise in our bands that are showing our unique features and storing it away at the end where we have our incoherent noise. So once again, we also get clearer values there. When you use techniques like PCA and MNF, however, you gain unique bands, but something really important is your bands lose their inherent meaning. So they're no longer red, green, or blue, or whatever color spectrum you're using there because we've reprojected them. And so this is a very important thing to think about when you're doing processing, because a lot of the time, the value that we have with hyperspectral data is that we are getting interactions with very specific reflectance features. But when you use PCA, you only have unique features. So you can use PCA as part of the analysis, and then you can go back to your original imagery to see how it overlays and reacts is probably the best way if you want to stay more grounded into the physical responses of things. It does make things a lot quicker though. So that is a little brief overview on principal component analysis and MNF. The other thing I'm gonna do a very quick overview on is spectral angle mapper or SAM. Spectral angle mapper is a classification technique that compares the angle of our reference spectra and the image spectrum in n-dimensional space. So you can think of it as I have a signal that I've chosen, just like say I chose plastic, and it has a very specific response. We project that into like a manifold, n-dimensional, swirly, sort of inception-style space, and we have it as an angle. We then test that against all the other pixels in our image, and we see how similar that angle is in between our reference one, or shown here on the screen, and our unknown pixels. We then, if they're close enough, we can say that they're probably the same class and it is classified. So the closer the angles are, the more likely a pixel is the same as the reference. You want to use spectral angle mapper when you're working with unique spectra. It also is very good at limiting false positives because it has very set boundaries on what actually counts as part of that spectrum. So if you're looking for very unique features or you want a very high accuracy spectral classification, Spectral Angle Mapper is a very amazing tool to use. And with that, I can actually show you uh, some beautiful pictures here. Uh, it's gorgeous. So what we have here is an MNF rotation. So we apply the minimum noise fraction to a Worldview 2 image to pull out if there was something unique and different within our scene. And in this lovely sort of yellow green mess, you can see a singular red or about maybe three-ish red pixels. Those red pixels are actually a net that was found. Uh, and so we're just using a simple rotation to pull out those unique values. We already have sightings on a singular net in the entirety of a very large ocean. With that though, we can use this to do further processing now that we can see the net itself. With that, you can click on this little net right here I can choose it as my specific area of interest, and then I can run it through Spectral Angle Mapper. So we're choosing the MNF response. We can click on it, have it, use it, use it to plot unique information, and then run it through our processing to see what kind of results we get. That makes it very easy just to go through and find a net in the middle of the ocean. On the other hand, 
we also have thesis. So on this one, we have a lovely image by uh, Amanda O'Connor, where this is thesis imagery that is also looking at different debris that is in the water. The way this process worked was very similar to the using of MNF and SAM, but instead we used something called RX anomaly detection, which is actually very similar to adaptive coherence estimator. So I don't need to go into too much details about that different acronym here as well. Once the data has been set, we can view the anomalous profiles and take a look at creating spectral signatures to pick up the kind of debris that is on the surface. And the reason why it's here is because similarly to using the stuff over the world view two imagery, we once again use SAM to separate out the anomalies from the plastic that are floating on the surface. And here are our results. So on the left-hand side, we can once again see our net. In this case, it has been classified. And there were very few other, there was actually no other plastics that we were able to find of that particular type in this image as well. However, testing this on other images with that same uh, MNF rotation, as we like to call it, so changing the image in the same way, we were able to pick up other plastics that existed. And with the DSIS data, you were also able to see those hotspot areas that were classified as debris on the ocean surface as well. So we have covered then aerial, and we've covered space station, and we've covered satellite. Time to get down to some very much closer to Earth techniques. Next, we're going to be looking at organic matter. So the data that was used here is a spectrometer. And the method that was used was principal component analysis. Uh, this was actually from a paper called Uses of Hyperspectral and Multispectral Laser-Induced Fluorescence Imaging Techniques for Food Safety Inspection. And yes, we're looking for fecal matter as it is on different kinds of, uh, in this case, apples, but in a whole bunch of different situations. And I do, I thought this was pretty important to show, uh, just not only because I could put a lovely little joke on the screen, but also because it showcases something that people don't usually think of when they're thinking of hyperspectral data, or might not think of if you've mainly worked like me in more of a geospatial sense of things. As a hyperspectral data is also amazing to use in situations when we're looking at things like agriculture or just items. Uh, it's used in medical use cases as well. And there's a lot of different things that we use hyperspectral for beyond looking at the Earth's surface. So I figured this would be a very interesting one to take a look at because we use the same techniques. We're just a lot closer to what we're actually looking at. So let's take a look at that uh, sensor. So this is the, the sensor that they used was the Inspector V9 which was from the Instrumentation and Sensing Laboratory from the USDA, and it is a spectrometer. It had about a six millimeter spatial resolution, though that can be changed because it is a uh, line scanner, so you can apparently change the exact resolution that you get, and it has about 79 bands between 425.7 nanometers to 951.2 nanometers, so we have some very good coverage here as well. The process that we used here, or that was used here, excuse me, used both PCA, so principal component analysis, to pick up those unique values and looked at very specific wavelengths to see if they could pick up the fecal matter that had been placed on these apples very easily and quickly during the detection. Because that was the really important part of this process, was the need to get this done quickly. If you're going to set up a system that maybe does even real-time analysis of different kinds of uh, organic matter that might be on materials and needs to be done quickly as if almost during a processing line. So PCA and choosing very specific wavelengths that were related to the apples reflectance responses were used to take a look and see if they could pick out those differences. So on the image on the left, we have the PCA bands over these apples and the same rotation, the same change was done to all the different apples in the study. It's very interesting. Please take a look at that cited paper I put there to see if they're able to pull up the PCA bands for all, I think it was 98 apples in this study. And you can see that we get some very good coverage and outlooks on a lot of these PCA bands for picking out those unique values. The wavelengths also worked very well on taking a look at those changes that occurred. However, they did have some complications actually with chlorophyll in this case, interfering with some of the fecal matter responses. All right. So 
yeah, in this case, we're taking a much closer look at what's happening on the surface and we can actually see, you know, how we're pulling out this kind of information and then how might it be used to take a look at that data. Lastly, for the use cases and examples, I had to throw this one in. Uh, this is DSIS data from Teledyne Brown Engineering DLR and the method that they used was MNF or minimum noise fraction. This was also done by the lovely Amanda O'Connor uh, when she was working with a little bit of a data set over the Falkland Islands where she found a little path and she might have found some beach colony areas for the rockhopper penguins, uh, also related to their organic matter, which is why it's in this part. Uh, and she was also taking a look at the nutrient-rich water. And we can just sort of see from this lovely image, the transformation where we're able to see green is the water, blue is that land, red is that nutrient-rich water, and yellow is sort of a combination of the land and water itself. So a little bit of a fun note to end this part of the presentation on. So with that, we've covered the main parts of hyperspectral data analysis. There are a lot more things we could talk about, subpixel analysis, going into different kinds of processing steps, the end dimensionality that I've been talking about a lot more. That'd be more like a class than a presentation. So feel free to reach out if you want to know about any of those things. But now I'm actually going to go into how to show your hyperspectral data who's the boss. Because I've shown you how to do all this kind of stuff now. We've talked about it. But what if you want to make it work a lot easier? And so in that case, when I want to show my hyperspectral data who's the boss, I use something called the NV modeler. What the modeler does and is, it allows you to make automated workflows to make your processing a lot easier. So from the before you process, where I said, oh, you need to orthorectify, you need to atmospherically correct, you need a mosaic. And then after you do all that, you still have to go through and you know use a classification technique or use MNF or PCA to get those unique results. That's a lot of steps you have to go through. And if you're doing this on a more large scale, you might have to repeat this process multiple times. So the NV modeler makes that a lot easier to do. How it works is it use, uh, you can build workflows inside of the NV modeler. So here's an example of the framework and we'll get a little bit more into it into the next slide, but you can use it to automate your processes. You can build your own workflows with NV tasks. And what I mean by that is a lot of the different things we've seen today have been what is called taskified. So they're singular tasks that you can link together and have work together very easily and go from step to step to process to process to get your output results. These tasks can also be exported to ArcGIS and to Python. Uh, we also have an IDL Python bridge to use that. But so you can make these tasks in Envy and then export them to where you need them to go, which is always a very good thing when we're trying to take a look at hyperspectral or hyperspectral outputs in any kind of environment we need them in. So let's take a look at the modeler in total. So I have the modeler here. On the left hand side of the screen, I have what are called basic nodes. Those are, you can think of as the inputs, outputs, parts of loops. We don't technically have full loops, but iterators and aggregators, ways to filter, and just sort of the overall steps that you want to go through for your process. Underneath that is a tab called tasks, and there is a very large area filled up with all the different tasks that exist in Envy. What you do to start this process is you would take the input parameters or a different file type. You can click and drag it into that main area in the middle, and it will pop up as one of those cute little boxes. So for this example, we have an input parameter that is in that little pink color that has a line connected to it straight across the top to spectral angle mapper classification. Say what this means is once I've drawn a line in between them, Sam will say, all right, to do my process, I need an image. It'll then tell my input parameters that it needs an image. So when I was to ever run this, input parameters would open up and say, what image do you want to use here? Once I've input that image, I can run it through the process and have it go through Sam itself. In this example, we also have the inclusion of what is called a veg underscore one dry.sli, also known as a spectral library. So this includes a whole bunch of different spectrum that exist, and it's already just in Envy that you can use for this one in particular, and a lot of other ones actually. And what the bottom part of this process is doing, it is it's picking up very specific spectra, so the query spectral library, the get spectrum from library, and we're making them into what we want to classify our image that has been put into that input parameters tab as. So we're querying those, we pull that through, 
And then if you look at the pink box again, you can see the bottom line is going to something called extract properties and metadata. So for our spectral libraries, those are usually created with ASV or in the field, and they can be very, very, very high quality, just you know, very large. They might have thousands of bands and they might be very discrete, but our input image might not. It might be a multi-spectral image. So it might have eight bands that are not very discrete. So what we're doing here is we're telling our system this image that we have, here's our wavelengths, here's our bands, here's our coverage. And you're then gonna resample our spectral library so it matches that so we can use it for classification. And then once those two things are done, they're both put into the spectral angle mapper and we have it classify and we can get our output results. We can view them in Envy, we can have them open up in the data manager, just however you'd like to do it. So if you're doing processing a lot, this makes it a lot easier and a lot more simple and you can make this as complicated as your heart desires. I personally enjoy making Franken bottles that are just humongous, gigantic messes that work really, really well. But you can also make them very simple for some procedures that you just want to have run. So this is definitely showing your hyperspectral data who's the boss. But to really do that, we're going to talk about something called NV Server. So originally, this, this definitely like this comic was made by one of our team members, and it's fantastic. But I definitely feel like the person on the left where I did use to a lot, where you know, I'm doing processing and hyperspectral data for on a SAR data, multispectral, huge data sets maybe. And it's gonna take a really long time to process, but I can't do anything else on Envy while it's processing. And so what Envy server does is it makes so you can run jobs in parallel. And so you can run things in the background so I can run multiple things at once. And I don't have to worry about, you know, having to sit and wait for something to finish processing while I work on a similar step or maybe work with a different data set while that's working. So it saves time by running the processes in parallel. And if you want to really get stuff done very quickly, you can even run with multiple NV servers where you can run on multiple computers and have your jobs done very, very, very quickly. So you can distribute the processing to local servers with common data access. So when might you want to use this kind of thing? Well, if you're a multitasker, you know, if you're a user that wants to do more than one thing at a time with Envy, it allows you to seamlessly run processing in the background. So you can, you know, work on one project and then a completely different project all at the same time. If you're a data processor, also, yeah, uh, if you have a lot of data to process, Envy server lets you run multiple jobs in parallel to get through those large volumes of data a lot faster. Processes in parallel to take advantage of many CPUs and SSDs just to make things go. If you do a lot of server-based processing, so if you have access to a server that has a lot of data processing capabilities, you can use Envy server to run that processing on network machines instead of on your small lightweight laptops. Though this does assume something called common data access which means the machines that you're using have to pull the data from the same place. It has to be labeled the same way and just in the exact same position. So just an important note when you start to use things like Envy Server. And lastly, if you're doing deep learning, once again, a user who might not have the best GPU on their computer for deep learning can use Envy Server to run deep learning processes without needing the hardware on your machine. So you can run all the deep learning stuff you want, even if your computer is very lightweight. And once again, this does assume that common data access. How you access NV server is you can run processing uh, through the NV modeler or the NV task dialog. So on the top image, hopefully that looks a little bit familiar to you now, but you can go run module in the background or run model in the background to take a look and have it run on your NV server. And then you can pull up tasks themselves in NV and have those run in the background itself. One other really cool thing here is using the NV server in AWS. So if, say for example, I have a storage gateway where all my data is stored. I can then call that data to, you know, I have it linked to both my local machine and my Amazon EC2 instance. So they're both pulling from that same common data access. With that, I can then do an NV server command I can send it up to my EC2 machine, which will do all the hard processing because maybe my computer is like a little laptop that I'm using right now. And so I can do all the processing up in the cloud. Then that data is returned to the storage gateway and then I can access it on my local machine to see my output results. And then it is finished. So a very easy way to just make everything work together very simply and very quickly. 
And for a real life application, let's go back to that, you know, and also to end it on Cuprite Nevada because I have to, uh, let's go back to that beautiful Avarice Next Gen Cuprite image. Each one of those purple boxes is a separate image. Each of those images is 2.5 gigabytes. Each of those images has over 300-ish bands. I think 200 to 300 bands. And I need to mosaic all of this data together, every single band. I want to use this entire image. And I really don't want this running in the foreground of my processing. It would take way too long. I need to do other things. So this is the like use Envy server for this. It'll run in the background. It can run on a separate computer. It can run a lot quicker to be able to mosaic this entire image together without me having to wait for the kind of processing that this would take. So uh, just a real world example. And like I said, to make sure we ended on Cuprite Nevada. And with that, uh, I guess we can take any questions. Great. Thanks, Megan, for this presentation and the wide variety of applications uh, for hyperspectral data. Uh, I did like uh, that you you showed an example how you can use tools for working with hyperspectral data uh, and also with multispectral data as well. So some of the image classification algorithms work for hyperspectral or multispectral. Um, it doesn't have to just be your hyperspectral data. Yep. You can even uh, use it on an RGB image if you feel like it. <laughs> So as Megan said, we're gonna spend a, a few minutes going over some questions. We've got uh, plenty of time and I know we've answered quite a few. So feel free to ask any in the chat box. Otherwise I've got uh, four here for you, Megan, um, that I think would be important to cover. Um, so the first one is, uh, do you have to pay in order to access MV Modeler or MV Server? So you don't have to pay to access MV Modeler. That is part of MV 5.6. It is just for NV in general. I don't think we're on 5.6 anymore. No, we still are. We're good. Uh, it is just part of NV. If you wanted to open it and you have NV, it's Control M, or you could just open it through a, a tab at the top of the screen. Uh, for NV server, you have to have GSF to have that load up with your NV modeler instance as well. Yep. And everybody has access to that. So um, nobody has to pay in order to use NV model or, or NV server. Um, there's the extra download that Megan was, Megan was talking about that in the uh, flex that uh, download and licensing portal online. Um, this is hopefully a pretty simple question here, um, but I think an important one that was shown in one of your NV model or workflows. Why is it important to resample your spectra from a spectral library before, say, using something like spectral angle mapper to, to map where something is in your scene? Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, the short answer is it won't work. <laughs> the long answer is, is that when you're looking at spectra and let's say you have a multispectral image versus your spectral library, which is a uh, hyperspectral image, your spectral response is going to look very different because with your multispectral image, you don't have as many discrete points that will exist as with your hyperspectral image. And so you need to make it match, match in a way so you can actually do your processing and get your results. So if your data is too good, if your spectral library is too good, it won't be able to be compared to your multispectral data that you're using. And even if you're using a hyperspectral image versus a hyperspectral library, they might not have the exact same number of bands or wavelengths that match. And so they still need to be resampled to make sure you're able to compare, like I said, apples to apples and oranges to oranges to get those output results. Perfect. So speaking of comparing apples to apples, <laughs> and this, this is uh, potentially a little bit of an opinion question here. Uh, if you're working with hyperspectral data over time, what would you say that the most important pre-processing step is to make sure that you are comparing time one and time two correctly, apples to apples, as you just said? Uh, well, there's actually two. Um, I'm, I'm cheating. But orthorectification and atmospheric correction are the most important because atmospheric correction, of course, you need to do to do comparisons to make sure that you're doing things over time. But if your image isn't in the right spot, even if you move by a singular pixel, if that's the pixel that you're looking at, your data now is defunct. You can't use it. So making sure that everything is exactly where it should be and everything shows what it should are both the most important parts of doing any kind of time series analysis with hyperspectral data. So maybe to rephrase a little bit what you said there, it's the make sure the Im images are registered to one another so mm -hmm. that, you know, 
if you're looking at a pixel in time one, it's the same pixel for time two, and it's not really 10 meters over, which like you oh. said, it's, it's not going to uh, give you any useful information that way. Um, and then I think a subtle little note there about atmospheric correction is what with atmospheric correction, your units are um, at the end of the day uh, can be top of atmosphere or surface reflectance. Mm. Um, so which one is more important uh, as far as making sure your data is pre-processed the same. I mean, you want to go to surface reflectance if you can, just so you can ignore the atmosphere. <laughs> we, we like to image from space, but we also dislike the atmosphere a lot. Uh, we don't want it unless you're studying the atmosphere, in which case, yes, of course you want the atmosphere, but we want to get to surface reflectance if we can, because then we're actually looking at the objects of interest themselves and not at any kind of interference that can occur from the top of the atmosphere to the Earth's surface. Perfect. All right, so I have another question as well. And this is, let me see, I've got your slides up over here. Um, if you could pull up slide five, the before you process ortho rectification. There you go. Yeah, so there was a, a, a question in the chat, and I think this is this is something very subtle that's really hard to to tell without calling it out. Is so, for example, and, and if you look at the image on the left, if you're collecting data with a push room push broom sensor, um, how do you actually map where those images or where those pixels are on the ground? Um, and it might be worthwhile to point out the little squiggles that you see on the left and not on the right, because otherwise it just looks like an image to the untrained eye. Yeah, I can. I think I have like a pen. Uh, I do, maybe. Fantastic. So when I first look at data, uh, when I first pull in data, at first I take a look at the metadata to make sure it's actually working. And then I usually just pull that image into Envy to take a look at it. And when you're working with agricultural fields, it's actually the easiest to see if something's wrong. Uh, just because people like straight lines. In some areas, this is not true. If you're looking at agricultural fields that might be taking a little place in, in like uh, South America, that's definitely not true because usually they're fit in open clearings between trees or they have different agricultural practices. In a lot of different nations, however, we do really like our straight lines. So when I first opened this image, the first thing that I saw was this tree line right here. And I was like, okay, that, that's pretty, it's pretty okay. But that directly made me look at this. So we've got this hump, and then if we follow this agricultural line down here, we can see some areas where things just don't seem to match. And then if you go to the right-hand side here, it becomes a lot easier to see where something, if this is a road, how a road is supposed to be, that's a very poorly made road. So just taking a quick look at this, I can start seeing like, all right, there seems to be some kind of artifacts. There seems to be something that this needs to be ortho rectified. This needs to be registered. It's not as straight as it should be. Roads are always a really good thing to take a look at. Uh, parking lots, the sides of buildings. So for example, this guy right here is very telling. When your building looks like a wave, either that building needs to be checked on or you need to make sure that your data and imagery becomes ortho rectified. And so if we compare these key points to the image on the right, our building is no longer a wave. We have a straight line of this road right here, as well as our areas along this, uh, the side of this field right here have also become a lot more straight. And so this process was done with, I think there were, there were GCPs or points for this one in particular to make it ortho rectified, but there are ways you can also do things such as image to image registration. If you have a background image, like say a satellite image, and you have flown over the area and unfortunately you don't have GCPs, you can actually set it up to create those ground control points between the image that you flew and maybe that background satellite image to help ortho rectify and correct the imagery that you have. Perfect, thanks. And maybe just one little note to add is also there's different types of processing. So like if for some hyperspectral sensors, you might get like uh, IGM uh, mm -hmm. files or uh, there's some uh, very detailed text file, metadata files that tell you exactly where the sensor was looking when it collected each row of pixels for like push broom sensors. Um, so it, it might change a little bit based on, on the data that you collect. Yeah, but they all, they all exist. They're all very easy to use. Just make sure you know what's X and what's Y. Uh, <laughs> I'm not speaking from experience or anything. Yeah. And I, I, I just like 
the great visual here of squiggly lines on the left, where it's the raw data, has it been you know, georeferenced or orthorectified? And then over on the right, it's not just rotating the image, it's uh, uh, there's some other things that have happened there too. Um, so I think uh, one more question. Um, so if you get data that is already atmospherically corrected, do you need to do that as a pre-processing step? So this was a fantastic question because whenever I hear that, the first thing I ask is, all right, how, where are they in the atmosphere correction? Did they stop at radiance? Are they at top of atmosphere or do you have surface reflectance? Let's say and it's surface reflectance. Go ahead. That, that should be perfectly good to just jump in and use in your processing. You can, of course, double check just by clicking on maybe a single point and seeing what the spectrum looks like. But if it's already been pre-processed, it's good to go. Awesome. So I don't know if there's any other questions uh, that I think we need to answer live here. I think we've gotten most of them. There's quite a few that we've answered. Um, so if, if your question hasn't been answered, we will be sending a follow-up with kind of a, a, a Q&A or a FAQ for the frequently asked questions here. Um, but otherwise, I want to say thanks again, uh, Megan, for taking the time to present to us today.